Margus Simpson from Commerchant Banka. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think that our Estonian ambassador already uh, gave quite a good overview about what the digital identity is and then what you can really do with it. It is just, um, I, I will skip some parts of my presentations or move over faster because I think that she gave an excellent overview about uh, what you can do with a, with a solution and, and why. But I have been always working on the other side of the story. I'm, I'm, I haven't been that much a government person, but uh, as I, my nationality is also Estonian, I I'm, have been working there for the digital services for my 20 years, dealing with everything else, the banking, the telcos, the healthcare, the education, just name it. And then most probably we, we dealt with those kind of digital services behind the scenes. So. I wanted to rather to show today the other side of the story. What happens to those companies, to those individuals uh, when they really use the digital identity and also showing what is the promise of the digital society? What does it really mean in the entrepreneur's perspective, from the business's perspective, from the individual's perspective? And for me, digital identity and digital society are very much interconnected things. They um, you can't have the digital society without the digital identity. So as I'm here working as a chief digital officer in Commercial Bank already for the last two years, then I have started to very much value what does it really bring for me that we have the opportunity to live in the more digital society as such. I remember the excellent moments when I spent in the immigration office because you still need certain paperwork in order to work um, in the country for a long time. I spent the whole day in this Czech immigration office. And these kind of things, usually, I'm already so much used to do things in just a matter of minutes. I just sold my car while sitting in some kind of meeting approximately a year ago. I didn't have to go anywhere. I received an email. I gave it a digital signature. I sent it back. Boom, everything done. So these kind of situations are the ones that quite often people can't even imagine how, how well and, and what kind of value do they really provide. But let me move on. Um, some parts of the story. And now, when we are talking about um, um, what does it really mean to do simple business, um, this is actually quite an old slide. You can open a business, for example, in less than 20 minutes. Usually, the most difficult part is to figure out what you want to name the company. All the rest is already happening behind the scenes fairly easily. Declaring taxes in the matter of three minutes, I will show a very quick example how you can actually do it in just zero minutes, zero seconds. Your effort is not needed anymore for the tax declarations at all. As already was mentioned, all those e-prescriptions, i-voting, uh, electronic voting, all of those state services online, there's actually a good reason why the uh, mortgages and marriages are not online yet, because um, certain people just want to make sure that you are doing this activity with your own free will. So the marriage and, um, and uh, buying some kind of real estate is being considered as those kind of events where we actually want to be sure that the person is fully sure that they want to do that. This is our tax declaration still, but it will change soon. But the tax declaration in general is the, something that you basically click through. It's like, typical installation approach, next, 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 finish. And then you are done in a matter of minutes. What we are rather envisioning here is that Estonia, and this is not going to be the exact picture as it will look like, but Estonia is rather moving towards this kind of approach where we are saying, here is the simple overview page. It says, this is your taxable income in a very simple wording, in a very simple manner put. This, These are your deductions that you can just deduct from your, your income. And this is the money that you are going to get back. But as we have your account number already from the past, then there is no reason why you have to do anything. As you see, this page does not have a button to push for the average person. So if you are that kind of person, 95% of the people actually do not change anything in the pre-filled tax declaration at all, then the tax taxes will be declared for you. Money will be returned back to you automatically without you doing any kind of effort in the whole story. 
And this is the general idea. And this is what should become true, I think, already next year, that the general idea is to move towards those kind of invisible services. Things just happen. They do not require your participation. They do not require your effort to make anything happen. And, and this is the logic what uh, if you if you talk to the to the people who are responsible for the digital services of the government today, they are very much moved towards this direction, how to make the services behind the scene invisible. Why I'm still talking it again, reminding digital identity is the core element without that one, nothing else will be happening, you can do whatever kind of pretty picture. But if you don't have the fundamentals in place, then nothing is really um, can become true. And that is the moment where I would like to just say, what are those kind of common backbones of the digital economy? What we need to build also here in Czech Republic, I already, as you see, I speak in the we form after two years in, in Prague. But for me, the backbone of the digital economy is similar to the like the equivalent to the roads and electricity network. They are such kind of core element without what the society just cannot operate anymore properly. So what is the equivalent of the roads and electricity network in the digital economy? The first one, authentication. You can't get over that. Um, the Estonian ambassador already mentioned the, that 91% of the people use the ID card, 98% already have the ID card. But the most important element here is, and that is something I, I see that the Czech Republic is going a slightly different direction, is that they have one common solution. Not two solutions, not five solutions, not 25 solutions, but one common solution that works in every service the same way. That is backed up by the state, that is backed up by the main um, private um, services companies as well. This is why when I'm looking at all of this discussion right now that you know we have the bank ID and, and Philip Herring will be talking about it later. And, and we have now another association that is working with bank ID. If I'm just putting aside all kind of uh, that who works where and then why, just as an Estonian citizen, as a person who has been living with this kind of digital economy for the last 10, 15, 20 years, I'm just saying it's a plain stupid thing to have. Competing solutions on the authentication side. This is something that you have to build once, create once, and cover as widely with different services and then with different um, um, users as, as possible. The second element here is actually what is even more important for me than just an authentication. Also, when we are talking here about the bank ID, bank ID is great. It's just a start. It is something that enables a lot of things to start to happen. But digital signature for me is this kind of crucial service that is making the difference. Yes, you can authenticate, but you can log in into your internet bank or mobile bank or, or any of the services also with other means. And it doesn't make such a, such a difference. But state-backed, government-backed, digital signature that is providing you the opportunity to sign whatever, wherever you are, whenever you are. This is the game changer. In Estonia, it was really difficult to initially to get this kind of digital signature off the ground because people still said that, you know, but giving a signature is such a simple thing. Why should I make any kind of additional effort? You know, install something, learn something new. But the key element actually was the CEOs um, of the companies because the CEOs were really busy people and they usually had to give tens and sometimes hundreds of signatures per day, especially when they participated some kind of big government tenders or European tenders where you had to sign every single page of the, of the offer, actually in three exemplars. So these people understood I just give one signature, one pin code basically, and all of those 800 pages are done. So they started to move, they started using the digital signature. And the good thing about them was that when um, a new employee came to the company and the CEO said, here is your signed contract, digitally signed contract, 
assign it yourself as well. And the employee said that, but I don't know how to use it. Then the CEO's response in general is that I don't care. I have already signed it. If you want to work here, go figure it out, how to make it done, five minutes and everything will be okay. So people got used to that. But digital signature, I actually remember very vividly that um, when I was an entrepreneur in Estonia, I, I participated plenty of government tenders. Once I signed all the tender documents and sent them to the government office, 3 a.m. in some kind of Portugal hotel lobby. I could do that because I did not need to be physically present. And the fact that you don't need to be physically present, that is the game changer for all of you. Whenever you have tried why the digital services are so great, just because it gives you the freedom to be wherever you are and do whatever you want. to. The third one, and that is now crucial something that the state has to back, but the private sector has to agree with, the standardized exchange of information. Whatever you do, you do not create proprietary solutions. You create everything that applies to the standards that have been agreed, European-wide, country-wide, doesn't matter, and you stick to those, meaning that you open up the possibility for everybody else also to chip in and participate build this ecosystem here. If you are creating something proprietary, I think British tend to be very good at those proprietary things, then sooner or later you are just going to write off the investment and you are starting from the scratch again. Open, open solutions for everybody to join in. They are the crucial elements here. And the government has to create a lot of work on the standard side to make it happen. One thing that has been actually very heavily underestimated, quite often, especially the technology people, we, we like to come up and say, you know, technology has been set up, everything is working, servers are up and running, there's a green light. So why the people do not come? Actually, the biggest effort in any of those digital economy creations is not the technology. The biggest element is actually about educating the users, adopting the new technologies, and building the worker skill to use those technologies. This is heavily underestimated, heavily. I think what one thing that Estonia did right was that in addition to the adopting the technology, this was this uh, public-private partnership that the ambassador was talking about, that this one created the connection between the actual users and the government identity as such. Putting it simply, government services in average are used 1.5 times per year, meaning tax declaration plus something else. But you do not, as a private, regular private person, you do not use the government services that much. How many times do you log in into your mobile bank? Several times per week, quite often even several times per day, depending where you work. So all the usage elements are actually sitting on the private services side. So this kind of partnership that the government backs the authentication mechanism, private companies are the ones who are pushing it to the users. And this is where I'm, I'm coming back to the original statement saying it's stupid to have several solutions in the, in the market. Because several solutions mean that you have to teach the average normal customer to use the solutions several times. The solutions work differently. They are not something that the customers get fully used. They always have to learn more. And that is actually driving down the adoption rate in the country. So that is also why I'm rather urging this country should have, I mean, 10 million people is not that big country. Estonia is 1.3 million, so significantly smaller, but 10 million people is not sufficiently big in order to incorporate a number of different technological solutions, and mostly because you don't get the user adoption that you otherwise need. And one thing that the private companies cannot do, but this is the, what the government has to do, laws, rules, and standards. I think still even five years ago, there was at least 100 places in Estonian legislation where it was still written into the legislation that something has to be given as a physical signature. 
because nobody in the 1995 imagined that there will be some kind of digital solution as such. And somebody just wrote it into the law that something requires a paper. I can assume very, very much and very similar situation happens here. It's not like, it's not a stupidity. It just is the legacy of the past that you also have to take out from all of those laws and rules and standards. And this is now the element that, uh, that has to be worked on. Few elements as well, and they are soft part, and they are now below the screen here. Demystify digital world. It is nothing different. Digital world is the current world. This is where we live. So we are actually not building the digital society. We are just improving the existing society. This is one of the mindset things. The second one, do not go in and try to create everything in one big go. Every small step is a progress. Regular agile development as such. So that instead of trying to build one full system, just get going small steps at a time and you will get that one. And always have this kind of like the mindset of curiosity. Do not accept that we have always done like that for the last 10 or 15 or 25 years. Czech country, Czech Republic, in my view, is fairly conservative. But at the same time, I do not believe in one moment that you don't want to use the digital services. So this kind of like the mindset of curiosity, whoever builds something, you will always thrive towards the better, the more stronger solution. 2% of the GDP was already mentioned. It is digital signature alone brought over the time. It basically has brought 2% increase in GDP. You're just actually not increase. You're just wasting less of your time, wasting, wasting less of the society's money and effort to make things happen. 2% of the GDP. Just to put the number into the context, if it doesn't seem big enough, it's equals to the spending of Estonian defense spending that is spent as a NATO member. So it's a huge amount of money that you are not wasting as a country anymore. Why I'm showing this picture, it's, it's a funny picture because you would assume that I will show the years 2015 to 2020 and beyond. I'm showing right now the years of 2000 to 2007. This was when the digital society groundwork was put in place in Estonia. So when we are talking that Estonia has been a successful digital country, 2015, 2020, you have something to take and, and, and learn from that, then this is the moment when the work, the groundwork was laid. And on top of that, a lot of new good things have been built. As you see, ID cards, tax declarations, electronic voting, they are all on that page. And, and this is something I'm, I'm rather also trying to say a lot here in Czech Republic. This is a long-term game. This is not something that happens immediately today or tomorrow, but this is something where you start with the right things and gradually over time, you are getting into significantly better shape. I think Estonia could pull off the same thing now rather in five years time. And that is what I would rather say also here in Czech Republic. In five years, those things can be achieved, but it requires a strong visionary approach behind the scene. Why is the digital society as or services in general important? So it expands the digitalization to the SMEs and less used services as well. This is actually a crucial element. Let's say Commerzni Banka, is big enough in order to deliver their own solutions, their own digital services, their own mobile bank, their own authentication mechanism. We have the KYC, know your customer well in place. Big companies can pull them off. But what happens is that when you create a common digital identity and digital society, then those small enterprises that do not have sufficient money, they start to flourish because they do not have to spend the fortune anymore to build the foundation. They can go on already from there. The second one, if you have a common solution, then the countrywide cross-industry ecosystem, that creates the network effect. Just imagine as a Facebook, if there is only one user, no Facebook, or the first fax machine. If you have only one fax machine in the world, no value in the world. But if you are building something that everybody is using, the network, network effect is tremendous. 
opportunity to create also your standards. And by, I mean, by you, I mean your country's standards, not adopt the Silicon Valley standards. Putting it this way, Czech Republic either creates the common digital society during the next five years, or someone from the Silicon Valley is going to come and create it for you. But taking all the profits and all the opportunities to adapt yourself together with it. So this is my statement. It's basically now or never. Otherwise, it's going to be already too late. And in 2025, now actually this slide was done before COVID came already. So by 2025, what can it be? Authentication, signature, killing also cash. As a banker, I already see how the cash is being killed by COVID quite, quite well. So, you know, let's keep up the good work on, on that side. So just the last thoughts here. The main barriers and failures, why things usually go wrong. First of all, failing to vision. You can't create digital society by improving 2% per year. You just have to make a leap in so certain elements. So this is something I would very much encourage. Make bold steps because they are the ones that are leading you to the right place. The operational small things, they have to happen as well. But without bigger leaps, nothing happens. The second, the corporate and government rules tend to kill the drive and execution. Private sector quite often starts to move and then we slow down. So this is something that I think that it's important. The only goal for those who are really in charge is to let the other people work better. Let them do the work, you know, get out of the way, do not disturb anymore. The third one, do not forget the customer in the process. So that what I already mentioned, the user adoption is the critical element. If the user adoption does not happen, nothing happens. It doesn't matter how good your technology is. So what would you want as a customer? Putting a lot of effort into the service design. And failing to simplify, Czech people are excellent engineers. One thing that I have learned is that you, from the physical perspective, you build excellent things, but you also like to build all the possible features into everything you do. Don't, simplify, ask question why, why that feature is needed. And done is always better than perfect. So instead of imagining the perfect thing, just get something done, make the next small step. And also this kind of what I sometimes remind that, you know, quite often some parties are saying we are too large to fail. We are important. We are so, so much in the, um, in the territory. Forget about it. We are nobody in the global competition. Estonia is nobody in the comp global competition. And in, even if you have eight times more people, also Czech Republic is nobody in the global competition. So you really have to come together as one thing in order to deliver something. So I put those kind of like the four key statements here, simple and ambitious vision, communicate, align, talk, share, you know, work together, simplify constantly and execute. The execution matters. Talking doesn't deliver anything, execution does. So use common sense, make things happen. That's something to work with. That's all from my side. Thank you for listening. Okay, so let me thank the speaker again. And uh, I have a few questions, if you don't mind, from our audience. Okay, can, uh, do, do you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the first question is about the Estonian uh, digital identity. Um, there was question about technical implementations, like is there a two-factor authentication, SSDI readers, NFC? So, um, I hope people are using it, right? Um, uh, so maybe some technical, I mean, I know it could be hard to, to say, but uh, if you can at I, least comment. I, I, I try to answer as, as well as I can, because actually I'm not so much like a real technology person as here, but, uh, but rather a user-oriented person. But uh, two-factor authentication, of course. Um, one thing, when we take, for example, ID card or mobile ID, then they are based on the, the simple logic. There is something, um, basically as a physical device, either the card or the, basically the, the, the SIM card inside the phone, that one is the one that stores certain information. And the second factor is uh, the pin code that you have to enter. So there is this kind of like the two-factor authentication or the two-factor 
um, two factors are clearly in play. This is like the defining element. You can't have the proper modern authentication without two-factor uh, two um, authentication here. Okay, and uh, when you are using it, I mean, when, for example, when you would like to do something in, I don't know, with some public services, and then you, you're actually doing, right? You go somewhere and apply. So is there any technological solutions you are aware of? Or maybe it's... You mean when we are applying the uh, digital identity as such? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, um, in Estonian case, it's a bit different than the one that is being planned uh, here. In Estonia, all the identity, including digital identity, is actually issued by the government. So that is the work done by the police. So the first identity, what you get, you have to go to the government office and get that one. Uh, this has been also moved already quite significantly into the online world so that when you ha already have the, the uh, digit, let's say, identity from the past, then applying for the renewed version of the document is something that you can also do online. And that is fairly simple. And let's put it this way, there isn't any kind of remarkable technology that is needed because as the ambassador was al also mentioning, as all the databases are connected to each other through something that is called X-Road. Let's call it as a big API layer, basically, if you want. So okay. through that one, all of the government entities communicate with each other. And there's a rule, actually a law <clears throat> in the country that says you cannot collect the same information twice as a government. So if some entity in the government, some government office has already collected your information, it will be shared through this API layer, through this X road with the other participants, and you do not have to give it. I, I think it's extremely important law as such, because it is defining that the government office cannot make you run around, they have to run around. And that is the one that is simplifying the exercise here for the average user so significantly that we do not have to have any kind of like mobile apps to identify ourselves, you know, show the picture, usually the stuff that the banks do when they do the KYC or know your customer process. Okay, uh, you, you maybe touched the second question because uh, there is this apparent question about security. Uh, uh, the, an, an, another person from, from the audience is asking, who will assure what's happening with the data? You know, so because you are, you are collecting a lot of data and I mean, no, not you. <laughs> Uh, whoever is operating uh, the WHO system and uh, there is okay the society could be influenced by that or it, the data can be used so there is a general question it's a rather long time so I won't read it but the, the idea is is this uh, about who owns the data I, I think yeah. in a way everything that the government already has about you this is very big a question about do you trust the government with this information or not Actually, I trust government significantly more than I would ever trust Google or Facebook or any other social media organization. So regardless if the GDPR is there or not, I would say that I can see that I trust in general the government with data. What's the crucial element here? Another, like a small feature that exists. Um, a lot of government um, databases, of course, are used widely within the government system, but you can see who has checked your information. When you go and check, for example, your health information, you can also see what kind of doctors or people have accessed your health records. If you go into the car um, administration, or this kind of this car, car administration office, you can see who has accessed the available, publicly available information about your car. It basically says, that person with that ID code at that moment checked this information. And, and this kind of logic is built in everywhere. So you can always go as a regular person and check and ask for the justification from anybody who has accessed your records. I know that there is actually only, let's say, a few limitations. For example, if you are from this, uh, what it's called, uh, like the secret service of the country, <clears throat> 
I understand that their records are not publicly shown if they check your information, but this is more like um, a small element and they also have the audit mechanism how to make sure that they mis don't misuse the information. But that kind of publicity, pu public approach where you make everybody publicly, not publicly, at least for you as a owner of the data, you make the other people visible who have used the data, that is what is keeping it in check. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, that, that actually answered the question on the one level, which is like a personal data. Uh, uh, I believe that the, the, uh, the participant is also asking for the, the above level, which is like a, you can do so, sort of a big data analysis of the, of the data set and saying, okay, there is a movement, I don't know, anti-governmental movement in the society and you can uh, use it incorrectly. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me say like that, right? So, uh, Are there discussions about this or? No. None at all. Uh, none much. Actually, <laughs> none at all. It's it's basically, I think, and that is also the part of, of creating one common solution. At some point, people start trusting the system that much that they do not worry too much about those kind of concerns. I, I think in reality, this is all more as a concern in the normal European democratic countries. This is not something that happens so easily. So okay. I would say that I'm willing to trade off. I know that, for example, in the German market, a lot of um, people are concerned about it. And that is why a lot of databases are keep, kept like separate so that they cannot be really connected. I, I would rather put it this way. Uh, I'm willing to trade off a little bit privacy, lost privacy in order for the services to work better. And I always rather remind it this way. You have been using most probably Google for the last 20, 25 years or 22 years already. That information that these companies, Google, Facebook, and half of the internet owns about you is nothing compared to what the government owns about you. So if you are not you concerned about the Google and Facebook and you still use them, then I, I wouldn't worry too much about what the government can do about you. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Actually, it's very interesting and I have a few other questions, but we have limited time. So thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Uh, and we have to move on to, to some, keep, the, keep the schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you.